When you think about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, it's difficult to imagine this film without this particular scene. Like, what's up, danger? In a way, it is this movie's entire identity. It has our hero making a name for himself, which in turn is a reintroduction of a character that had historically played second seat to Peter Parker. And on top of that, it's a fantastic demonstration of the award-winning animation that permeates into the fabric of this film. But what is it about this scene that makes it work so well? Well, since you're on my channel, the answer should be a little obvious. It's the music. Now, there are plenty of clever little musical moments in this film, like if you noticed, when Spider-Gwen shows up, we start hearing rock music because she's in a band, but each of the other spider heroes get their own stylized music. Spider-Noir gets that classic film noir jazz sound. Is, is he in black and white? Where's that wind coming from? We're in a basement. Wherever I go, the wind. Penny Parker gets some of that anime-inspired upbeat electronica vibe. Hi guys. Hi, you and we get some of that classic Carl Stalling inspired Looney Tunes material for Spider Pig. Can get weirder. I just wash my hands, that's why they're wet. And whenever we see the Prowler on screen, we get this distorted elephant sound. Boy. And if you actually go and check out Daniel Pemberton's Twitter account, who just so happened to write the score for Into the Spider Verse, you can see all the little tips and tricks he used to put this score together, like putting newspapers on drums, or composing a score and then recording a turntable scratching a recording of that original score. Or perhaps my favorite little trick was how the hi-hats are actually the sounds of the spray paint cans that Miles uses, in essence infusing the soundtrack with Miles' character. Or you can even spot some of the extra TLC that went into this film when the music cuts out because Miles' headphones fell off his head. But all these little tips and tricks pale in comparison to the story being told in the music. All these little musical moments serve as a backdrop for how the Miles Morales Spider-Man comes together. See, when you listen to this scene, at first you might notice one thing that no other superhero theme has ever really emphasized, and that is that hip-hop element. Now, it isn't necessarily unusual to have rap and hip-hop in a film soundtrack, but I can't remember the last time I saw it during a superhero apotheosis scene, or that one big moment when the superhero realizes their potential. It tends to be that big brass sound that we might associate with Superman, or Batman, or even the Avengers. But Spider-Verse establishes how and why this music is so critical to Miles' identity. When we're first introduced to Miles, we hear him singing along with Sunflower. This is an instance of diegetic music, or music that exists within the world of the film. Miles can hear the music and is singing along. The film then cleverly moves on to Familia, demonstrating Miles' half Puerto Rican identity, but it's difficult to discern whether or not this music is diegetic at first, that is, until his headphones fall off. Now, I'd really like to give you more examples, but in my experience, the YouTube copyright bot has a keen ear for soundtracks containing licensed music, as opposed to to an original score, but I want to make it clear that this soundtrack treats us to an all-star cast of top talent on a phenomenal album. So when we finally get to Miles' ascension as a hero, it's without question that we have his own musical identity put forward in the soundtrack. But there's a little bit of trickery here. Listen to this in the context of the film. And now listen to the studio version of What's Up Danger by Blackway and Black Caviar. Pemberton actually included some of the score under the hip-hop sound which helps adhere this track to the film's journey. But why? Well, let's break Pemberton's additions apart and see what we can find. First off, I want to start with this little motif, or a fragmentary musical idea. Although relatively simple, it's really just an octave leap up and back down, or at least that's what we're going to focus on, it develops a tremendous amount of storytelling potential throughout Miles' journey. We first hear it when Peter gives Miles the goober, in essence, starting Miles on his first step on his journey as a hero. No one can know. He's got everyone in his pocket. What if he turns the machine on me? We hear it when he's troubled, or trying to confront his obstacles. Like after Spider-Man dies and Miles runs to his family, we get this. Um... Do you ever think about moving out of Brooklyn? Our family doesn't run from things, Miles. And when he's trying to master his new powers and fails, we hear it again. We hear it when he's struggling with his identity as a spider character and teasing Spider-Man about a cape. Or when his uncle Aaron dies. You're on your way. Just or when his responsibilities as Spider-Man keep him from his family. <sighs> Do 
It's the musical idea that defines Miles' journey to become a spider hero. In essence, this is the leitmotif or musical idea that represents a person, place, or thing for Miles' story. But going back to our iconic scene, that isn't all we hear. We hear this little motif as well. It's just as small, but with a different interval and a different identity and meaning entirely. We first hear this idea when we're introduced to the first Spider-Man. There's only one Spider-Man, and you're looking at him. And this is essentially his theme, or I guess more accurately, his leitmotif, sorta. See, while Peter Parker is on screen, it plays all the time. Did you know your shoes are tied? I can help you, if you, if you stick around. I can... They really hammer home that this musical idea is directly associated with him. But after he dies, we end up hearing it again when we're introduced to Peter B. Parker. What a day. You know the rest. You saw I got married, saved the city. So because this isn't the leitmotif for a Spider-Man, it's the leitmotif for the spider hero identity. So as we would expect, when we're introduced to all the other spider characters, it's all over the place. My name is Peter Parker. My name is Penny Parker. My name is Peter Parker. Or whenever the Spider-Man identity comes up in general. And in terms of how it's played around Miles, we hear it when he lands his first web, effectively showing us how he's becoming more like a spider hero. <laughs> Or you can even hear it when Doc Ock acknowledges what Miles has become. Miles? Spider-Man? And so we have these three musical ideas. The licensed music that represents Miles' identity as a kid from Brooklyn just trying to make his way in life, a second idea that represents his personal journey through this story, and a third and final idea that represents something from the Spider-Verse like a spider person, or pig, or Rubik's Cube fan, or anything else that's been bitten by a radioactive spider. And so when we get all three of these ideas on top of one another, we get the musical climax of the story and the film, and it makes for this great scene. But that's not all. There's so much more to it than just that. See, this film is a little more complicated than just Miles becomes Spider-Man. Throughout the film, we see issues with Miles fitting in. He doesn't fit in at school. He has unique spider powers that the other characters don't have, which is actually hinted in the film when the spider that bites him changes colors depending on which paint can it's on. Shout out to r slash movie details for finding that one. But he's constantly juggling his various identities as a charter school student, a kid from Brooklyn, the son of a cop, a superhero, and even a graffiti artist. And when you look at the theme of this film, there's this notion of Miles carving his own path with the gifts that he's given, even if it isn't necessarily what others want for him. The spark in you, it's, it's amazing. It's why I push you, but it's yours. Whatever you choose to do with it, you'll be great. In 1949, Joseph Campbell wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, a book that outlined a story structure that functioned as an archetypal model for stories that people tended to tell one another. It's a template for folklore and legends, and you can fit a lot of stories told throughout human history into this model. And although it's been through many iterations and criticisms, the overall structure tends to be the same. You can see how this film fits into this model relatively neatly. There's the supernatural aid from the radioactive spider, the mentor in Peter B. Parker, the many helpers, the abyss when he can't control his powers and he can't become Spider-Man, the subsequent rebirth when he gains control of his powers, the apotheosis, the return with the gift. I'm not going to pretend like I'm super knowledgeable about story structure, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. But there's this notion in the hero's journey of passing between the known world and the unknown world. When the hero leaves home, goes off on an adventure, and then completes their journey by coming back home. And in his book, assuming that I understood it correctly, Campbell calls the first act of moving from the known world to the unknown world as crossing the first threshold. And this is, in essence, where the story begins. Luke leaves home, Neo leaves the Matrix, the Hobbits leave the Shire. If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest away from home I've ever been. And then, midway through the third act, the hero crosses the return threshold and returns to the known world with a power received from the unknown. Luke blows up the Death Star and returns home after becoming a Jedi during the Death Star trench run. Neo goes back into the Matrix to fight Agent Smith and becomes the One, and the Hobbits literally return to the Shire after throwing jewelry into the volcano. But the music in this critical scene guides us through Miles' own hero's journey. When we open the film, we hear a veritable medley of Miles' favorite music. Again, unfortunately, I won't be able to play much of it, but Miles' musical identity Identity continues to develop throughout the film, but only when he's in his known world of Brooklyn. When we need to see the people's reaction to Spider-Man's death, we get scared of the dark. 
When Miles is stressed out, he returns to what he knows by humming his favorite tune. And when he's at his lowest and tries to return home, we come back to the soundtrack with Hide by Juice World. And after he returns home at the very end of the film, the last thing we hear before the credits is Sunflower, exactly how the film began. In every respect, the hip hop that we hear in this soundtrack represents the real world that Miles comes from and returns to save. Now compare that to the Spider Hero motif, a motif that represents everything that is alien to Miles. This is a motif that is explicitly reserved to people and notions that pertain to the unknown world. Every Spider Hero, and even Miles gains seemingly alien powers and skills all exists in the unknown and is the power he acquires before his inevitable return home. Whether it be the comic book world of the actual Spider-Man or the literal extra dimensional creatures that he keeps bumping into, this spider motif represents the unknown world. And the only binding material between these two worlds, as is in the story, is Miles himself, which is why his journey is given a motif that is exclusive to Miles and his story. This is the motif that we hear during his journey. It's the motif for Miles's hero's journey. So right before we have our big scene, we have Miles's apotheosis or his ascension. He develops the ability to control his powers. And immediately following that, we have Miles taking those powers and demonstrating his mastery over them. And at this point in the story, Miles is crossing the return threshold, returning from the unknown back to the known world, which is why this entire entire scene not only takes place in Brooklyn, but is a direct contrast to an earlier scene when Miles was trying to understand his powers and failing. And what do we hear? We hear Miles' known identity with his spider hero unknown identity glued together with the musical idea that represents Miles' journey. It wouldn't have been fitting to just have one theme for this film and give it to every spider hero and expect it to work. The entire idea behind this film is Miles discovering himself. Yes, he becomes Spider-Man, but he becomes his own Spider-Man. And in that moment, we have a harmonious convergence of his two worlds predicated on the path that he took to get there. There's a line I remember hearing in the theater, and I found it in the special alternate universe cut of the film that came on the Blu-ray, and I think it's the most succinct way of explaining exactly how and why Miles became what he did. Because yeah, he's just another kid from Brooklyn, and yeah, he's just another person that got bit by some kind of radioactive spider, but in the end of the day, he's greater than the sum of his parts, exemplified by his journey, and is unique in what he became. Or, as Peter B. Parker put it, Honestly, Miles, don't do it like I did. You gotta do it like you. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my patrons for making these videos possible. With a very special thank you to AFN Matt, Andrew Luke, Billy Vasquez, Clara Tan, Dr. Woe, Donovan Hodges, Hayden Elza, Jordan Adams, Karen Rosenau, Who Am I, and Zolbutum and Dembrel. Also, thank you to everyone who requested that I do a Spider-Verse video. I loved this movie and it was tons of fun putting this together. If you'd like to request a video, keep an eye on my Patreon page. And if you like what you saw here, be sure to check out my other videos. And if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. But that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching.